Hello everyone, it is Chelsea Fagan and I am back with another episode of The Financial Confessions and I am incredibly excited about our guest today. In fact, it is the most requested guest that we got when we threw out the question on Instagram and I cannot wait to introduce him. Uh, but before I do, I wanna just quickly give a little nod to our amazing partner that we create this show with every week. So as you guys probably know by now, we make every episode of The Financial Confessions in partnership with Intuit. And and if you haven't heard of Intuit, you have almost certainly heard of all of the amazing products they make, most of which I literally use every single day. They make things like Mint, TurboTax, Turbo, QuickBooks, basically every product you could ever need to help get your financial life in order, help manage your money, understand your budget, get paid on time, do your taxes, like a mini CFO in your pocket that helps you do every financial thing you need to get done in a much better way. If you cannot wait to get started with Intuit, check them out at the link in our description or the show notes. So as I mentioned, our guest today is someone who was no less than the most requested guest when we asked you guys. He is a real estate broker, a YouTuber, a personal finance celebrity of sorts. And his name is Graham Stephan. Hey. Hello. <laughs> uh, for those who may not know, Graham is someone who earns well into the seven figures every single year, yet saves about 99% of his income, uh, which I find incredibly fascinating, primarily because it's like the exact opposite of my life. Uh, so for those who may not be familiar with you, Graham, can you mm -hmm. give a little context as to you know those numbers and how you got there and what you're really doing every day? Yeah. I mean, I started working as a real estate agent and that was now uh, almost 11 years ago, believe it or not. Time flies. I keep thinking it was like a few years ago. No, it's 11, 11 years ago. I started working as a real estate agent, got my real estate license, saved all my commission because the commissions that I was earning was so sporadic. I didn't know when the next deal was coming. So I just saved everything. Um, saved up enough money in 2011 where it made sense to start buying real estate. So I started investing in real estate, buying these like really cheap foreclosures fixing them up and then renting them out. And that continued. And as the market started getting better, my commission started getting more uh, frequent. And I started selling larger homes, started saving all of that money, kept reinvesting basically all of it back into buying more real estate. And then three years ago, I've always wanted to make YouTube videos. So that was always a dream of mine to be like, oh, you know, I could I can make YouTube videos and talk about like credit cards and personal finance and investing, saving money, basically all the things that my friends weren't interested in. I could talk to a camera and then have internet friends that would like to listen to me. So I started doing that. And then that just that blew I mean, blew all my expectations. Um, and now, I mean, it, that that alone earns earns over a million dollars a year from just the YouTube channel. It's just me. And um, yeah, and I would probably spend most of my day now making YouTube videos and talking about personal finance and like reading about the markets and reinvesting all that money back into more real estate, which oddly enough gives me more content to talk about. This is a naive question, but is there a difference between a real estate agent and a real estate broker? There is. So a real estate agent is someone who's gotten their salesperson's license. A real estate broker has their broker's license, which enables them to go and start up their own real estate brokerage if they want to. And you're a broker now. I'm an agent, but I've oh. taken... I, but I've taken all of my broker's classes. I just didn't take the state test to become a broker because once you're a broker, there's all these other fees that go along with it. And it didn't make sense for me to be a broker when I didn't have the intention of opening up my own brokerage. Got it. Well, learn something new every day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I mentioned obviously at the beginning that we, I think in so many ways have the exact opposite philosophical approach to, to money. And I'm, I'm so curious as to how you came to yours. You, you save 99% of your income thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Why are you building wealth? I think it's fun. Mm. First of all, I think it's, it's for me, it's almost like a challenge to save money. Like yes. I get so much enjoyment over just not spending it. I don't know why. It's like my brain is wired kind of weird that like even even I made my own coffee this morning. It's just like I, I revel in the fact that like, okay, if I can save $3 on that and invest it over the next 50 years at a 7% return, it's going to be worth like, you know, $200. Or whatever. That's just fun for me. Mm. Uh, but I think in the bigger picture, I think the more you save and the more you invest, the more options you have. And being able to save stuff like that on things that to me don't matter. It doesn't matter for me to get like, you know, designer Starbucks coffee or whatever. But that gives me more options in the future that if I decide one day, hey, you know, I want to want to go and travel the world for a year and, and not have to worry about a single thing, I can go and do that. Mm -hmm. Or if I want to live in Malibu on a beach, I, I can go and do that if I wanted to. So to me, the more money I save, the more options it gives me. And if I can cut back on the things that don't matter, like coffee and spend it more on the things that do, I just get enjoyment from that. Do you want to, because uh, I, I remember reading that you don't travel right now. No. Is there a time at which you want to do that? 
That's a tough one. I kind of in, in, in my mind, I'm thinking in like, you know, somewhere in my mid thirties, I would love to take the time and like, and travel. Cause I've never really been out of North America. Like I've been like, you know, across the United States and, and Canada, but haven't really been further out from that. So one day, I mean, it's a dream of mine to spend like six months to a year and just travel the world. Um, I feel like right now I built up so much momentum with my career that I want to continue that. And I'm afraid of, of taking a year off would, would kind of cut that. So you know, now, right now, my career is a priority versus traveling. But at some point, I will do it. Now, this might sound like a joke question, but it's very much not. What if you mm -hmm. die before then? What if I live? <laughs> but I think it's, I, for me, I use that as a, as a, as a very frequent motivating factor in my life because I, I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm not frugal. I definitely mm -hmm. have a lot of things about which I am frugal. But I try to be very aware of the fact that the one thing we cannot guarantee ourselves is more time. And although it's very likely that I will statistically be alive at the age of 40, let's say, um, I don't want to have a version of my life where there's like a before and an after, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like after this point, I will do that because it's not guaranteed. So when you're coming up with your before and after, how do you decide when is the after? I think in terms of the thought that you could die tomorrow, I think you. anytime you look at investing, you look at statistics. What am I right. most likely to make money on? And if I were putting money in something, I would think statistically I'm more likely to be alive in 10 years from now than mm. I am you know, to, to pass away. We're going to knock on wood here. And that's actual so, wood. So, so good. Uh, so I base my philosophy based off of that, that I think I'm going to be more likely to live than, than die. Uh, in terms of when is there an after, I don't know. I, I feel like when I feel like it's the right time and when I've gotten to the point where I'm like, I'm ready now, I'll do it. But at this point, I just don't feel like I'm ready. What do you decide is worth spending on now? Yikes. Um, <laughs> I would say sushi is nice. my one guilty pleasure that now I'm like, now I can spend a little bit more freely on like on sushi without having to be like, okay, we got to go like during the happy hour. Now we go to places that don't always have happy hour. And that's my, that's my guilty splurge is, is honestly, it's been sushi. Interesting. And yeah. what, uh, what makes sushi make the cut and not other things for you? I, just, I, I love sushi. There's something about it. There's something about the taste and, and it's just enjoyable. And I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it, it's good for me. And how would you, so do you feel that you had, because I think, I think a lot of our, our audience, we have very different audiences, mm -hmm. notably like our audience is like 90 something percent women. His is kind of the opposite. Um, and so I think people are sort of naturally drawn to, you know, whether it's a channel or whoever it is that they already kind of identify with. Mm -hmm. So it's very likely that a lot of people who watch you are already very interested in like hyper frugality. Is that fair yes. to say? Yeah. A lot of our audience isn't, and I think for many people, they could benefit from even just a year of living hyper-frugally. What are ways in which you could recommend someone train themselves to, to do that or get more into that mindset if it doesn't feel natural or naturally exciting to them? Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest things is to cut down on impulse purchases or things that really don't make that big of a difference. And mm. one of the ways that I would do that is really just think about what you want to get. And even if you wait like a day before you buy something, before you buy anything for that, just sleep on it for one night. And chances are a lot of what you would be spending money on just the next day you wake up and like, ah, you know, I didn't really need it that much. I don't really want it that much. And that enables you to spend more money on where it does matter the most to you. Because if right. after a week you still want something, then it might be worth it to look into it. Uh, the other thing that I kind of think through is what is this going to be costing me long term? So right. if I spend a hundred dollars on, let's say a pair of shoes, I think, well, how much am I going to wear those shoes? Is it going to be something I wear like twice and then never again? And then I think to myself, well, if I just invest that hundred dollars over the next twenty years in an eight percent, like it's going to be worth this much. Would I rather have you know X amount of money in twenty years than the shoes right now that I'm barely going to wear? Um, and sometimes every now and then I would rather have the shoes. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times I would just rather have the, uh, the 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 you know potential money you have in the future that would again give you more options to buy. You know, you could buy ten pairs of shoes in the future. Uh, one thing that we mentioned just before we turn the cameras on that we feel kind of opposite about, and it was funny because this time I threw out a number and he was like, what? Um, so I strive to never work more than 40 hours a week mm. uh, for a lot of reasons, but mostly because doing other things besides work is super fun. Uh, and he was like, I could not imagine, like I could never. And I'm so curious as to what you love so much about work and how much you work and what drives you to work that way. 
I find it really fulfilling mm. and I really find a lot of purpose in the work I do and bringing education of personal finance to people who are interested to learn about it. And if I could have a small part in improving someone's finances for the better or helping someone get out of debt or helping someone invest for retirement, that gives me so much joy. Mm. Um, but besides that, there is there's something about it that just gets me in the zone. Mm. Um, I, it would It would be almost akin to like playing music or going to the gym or meditating where you just you get in that focused point where it seems like either time stops or like 10 hours can go by in the blink of an eye and when you're in that zone you just have so much fun and you feel invigorated and that's what gives me like like life if that makes sense it's just is doing that now it's not necessarily work i wouldn't call that work but even though it is work but i just enjoy it so much i would like to be clear that i get no fulfillment or joy (laughs) out of bringing people personal finance education (laughs) I could not care less what you guys are getting. Um, So I actually threw it out to my followers on Twitter, my personal followers, actually, Mm. uh, who are, you know, they're a vigorous bunch, let's say. Uh, And I asked them what they would love to hear from you. And we got all kinds of questions. So I'm going to throw them out to you. Uh, Feel free to pass on some of them. All right, let's see. Let's see what they're doing to you. All right. I saw him in a Jubilee YouTube video earlier this year, and he agreed with the statement, anyone can become rich if they work hard enough. So what are his thoughts on how privilege affects your financial life? What do you mean by privilege? So how would you define I would give a very, I actually just in our last interview that we recorded gave what I think is a pretty clear cut example to me of Mm. privilege. So I um, came from a background where I did not have a lot of money growing up. um, And I mostly through my own idiocy completely destroyed my credit, went into default, did a bunch of terrible things Mm. uh, as a teenage, late teenager, early 20 something. And I did uh, in... um, I did take it upon myself to take steps to rehab my credit that were accessible to everyone. Like I got a rehab credit card. I Mm -hmm. took steps with my bank. But the number one thing that allowed me to completely uh, transform my financial life in a relatively short period of time is that my husband has excellent credit and was able to put me on his credit cards and was able to... Authorized user, guys. Exactly. That's how you do it. And very similarly, I was able to start what is now a profitable business uh, that employs, you know, a lot of people, uh, relatively, um, because I was able to not take a salary for two years because my husband has a good paying job that had health insurance on which I was a domestic partner and therefore beneficiary. So to me, those are all examples of, yes, of course, I think I had a good idea. I think I worked hard to build these things. I definitely took as many steps as were in my Mm -hmm. own hands. But as a direct result of having that relationship in my life, I was able to achieve things that I never, ever otherwise would have been, at least not in that span of time. So that to me is what privilege is. Got it. I think we're honestly all born with strengths and weaknesses. And I think there are some people who are predispositioned for certain things. Like, Like I would say sports is one of those things that you could be a really talented person, but some people are predispositioned to be an amazing football player or such a good basketball player. Uh, or be really good at boxing or wrestling or whatever it is. Um, so I think we all have strengths that we can play to. And, uh, you know, you know, I almost think it, it, of, of life and, and making money and stuff like that is is almost a, a game of, of playing poker. So sometimes people are dealt a really good set of hands and they can play that really well just from the very beginning without much effort. Like if you get like, you know, two, three kings in the, in the very first time, you're going to do well. Uh, but other people, I think, you know, who have like a pair of twos or whatever can certainly bluff their way and play to the strengths. Um, you know, in t- in terms of me specifically, I mean, I, third, I think I certainly had some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, if you looked at me from just being, you know, I had terrible grades, I didn't go to college, statistically, I should not have been successful whatsoever. But I had an interest in working hard and making money and saving as much as I can and really taking an interest to investing. So I think that helped. So I think anyone can play to their strengths and I think anyone can learn, especially personal finance, is something that you can absolutely learn. It's not something you're born with. Um, so I think anyone can be successful, and I truly do stand by that. Mm. Well, kind of on that note, actually. And it's funny because, so it's kind of become a meme at this point in the personal finance world. So most yeah. of the people that I would say follow uh, TFD are not what I would refer to as like personal finance nerds. Okay. There are people who are definitely looking to get better with money, but they're not, it's not, they're not into like the gamification of money as much. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're very much like, I'm sure you've probably seen, there's this meme now where like, 
a story will go viral on Twitter that's like, this 22-year-old saved $100,000. And then like by paragraph three of the article, it's like, and then her parents like, you know, gave her a small portion of their, you know, of their uh, real estate holdings or they paid off her debt or what have you. So I think for, you know, the people who follow us, it's definitely become almost a trope of the personal finance industry that once you scratch beneath the surface in success stories, there's often that kind of thing. And so to that point, uh, the most common question we got was some variation of this, which is, um, how did he get started with real estate? Did he get any startup money from family, friends, bank loans, anything? No, I did not. Um, I was really lucky that I had two parents that were really, really supportive of Mm. anything I did. And I was lucky to be born into a family where, um, you know, neither of my parents was abusive. Neither of them were, you know, into drugs or alcohol or anything like that. And I grew up in a supportive household where both of them really encouraged me to, to pursue my dreams, whatever that was, you know, whatever that would be. And they supported me from that angle. Um, I didn't get any help financially from my parents in terms of them, you know, like going and giving me money or anything like that. But um, in terms of emotional support, absolutely. I think it was a 10 out of 10 in terms of that. So you financed all of your initial um, real estate acquisitions through money that yeah, you had generated? Even, even working as a real estate agent, I, I paid for all of that out of pocket. I started working when I was 12 years old after school doing marine aquarium photography and i was so it's a weird story how this started i got i got i got a saltwater aquarium when i was 11 years old so Mm -hmm. yes so i did receive some some assistance from my parents when i was as as a kid no really my dad did end up getting me a saltwater fish tank for christmas and that got me so obsessed with saltwater fish i went on this website called reefcentral.com and i'd go it was a forum shout out yeah and it was a forum where people can go and talk about the saltwater aquariums and ask questions and stuff like that I'd spend like hours a day on reefcentral.com learning everything I could about saltwater fish. And there was this company that sponsored reefcentral.com and it was called reefermadness.com mm. or reefermadness.us at the time. We could, we could bleep that out. It's, it's, like, it's like a reef <laughs> tank, you know? Um, but anyway, Imagine bleeping they, were, they, they were one of the, uh, they were one of the companies that was like, like at the top, like sponsored like banner ads on yeah. reefcentral.com. Uh, and I just happened to randomly meet uh, the owner, Chris, at, it was one of these like aquarium places. And um, I was so into photography and like taking pictures of like reef tanks and stuff like this. And he offered for me to come by his shop. And I did. And I started taking pictures of like, like his livestock and stuff like that that he was selling. And he offered for me to come in after school if I want to take pictures of stuff. And he wasn't going to pay me, but he would give me like little pieces of coral and stuff like that afterwards. So I would <laughs> beg my mom like after school to go and drive me so I can spend like a few hours, you know, I don't know, twice a week. I would go in like Tuesdays or Wednesdays or whatever. Uh, taking pictures but that evolved to eventually like you know two years later that I would be working like spring breaks there my mom would just like drop me off in the morning and pick me up at night Um, and I would work spring breaks I would work summer breaks I would work like you know holiday breaks and I would do anything like I loved it so much but I got to the point eventually where I started getting paid and I started getting paid either hourly for the time that I was there or I would get paid a dollar for every picture I would photoshop of their livestock and put on their website so I would just, at that point, it was really like so much fun for me to go and, and like on Friday nights, when I first got my driver's license, that was when I started skipping school because I'd rather go there and work. But I would just, I would, you know, either skip school or I'd go like Friday after school and work until like midnight, just taking pictures. And like, it was fun for me to see how many pictures I could take. And there were some nights that I could make like 120 bucks in a night and doing that at like 16 years old was so much fun. But I saved all of it. I saved a few thousand dollars of that. And that's the money that I used to get my real estate license and to pay for all that sort of stuff. That is such a pure backstory. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man, I was expecting you to be like, my grandmother got hit by a truck and oh, left no. me, you know, 100000 Well, no, honestly, yeah. good for you. Good for yeah. you. I'm really, I have to say, I'm but, very impressed. But, but no, but I did, you know, have supportive parents that like my dad even had the ability to go and be like, here's a saltwater fish tank for, for your birth. So, and you know what? So like that, stuff yeah. like that, I, I like absolutely. I, I know there's a lot of people out there that didn't even, you know, have anything remotely resembling that. And I think that's so important because I think a lot of people, like the privileges that I outlined, I think are very clear cut Mm -hmm. financial ones. Um, But a lot of people won't even acknowledge that to have a stable, loving, supportive home of two parents is in and of itself an enormous privilege that is not available to everyone. You know, something that we have recommended a lot on the channel for people who are looking to, you know, either get out of a bad financial situation or save a lot in a short amount of time, obviously is to move in at home. 
And which is, I would say, amongst all the privileges, one of the more accessible, mm -hmm. but still not accessible to everyone. Like yeah. not everyone has a good home that they can move into, you know? Yeah. So props to you for acknowledging Thanks. that as a privilege. Of course. Truly. Um, <clears throat> what is the benefit of hoarding wealth? Does he feel an obligation to his community? And I think yeah. to to um, further elucidate that question, another person said, mm. "There's a tangible benefit to spending money in your community rather than hoarding it, and it will keep it will help keep your local economy going and jobs plentiful." I don't think it's hoarding money. I think people forget that I am putting money back in the economy. I mean, all my money gets spent. I, I don't want to make it people think that I'm just like saving all my money and doing nothing and sitting on a pile of cash underneath my bed. Keep in mind, I spend almost all my money back on real estate. Mm. in which I pay property taxes every single year. Mm. So you have to think, if I make you know a million, two million dollars a year, all of that gets spent either in taxes, which California I'm paying like over 50% in taxes on that top end income, like on a significant portion of my income. It's 50%. You pay over 50%? Yes. Total, wow. Oh yeah. No, because you're in California, 13.3% goes to that, um, you know, little miscellaneous S-corp fees, plus it's a 37% tax bracket. I mean, it, it adds up. So it's over 50% of my income does go towards taxes. But people forget that all that money goes back into towards real estate. So I'm giving it to a seller of a property, buying real estate in the economy, paying property taxes on a new assessed value of a property that is now bought higher than it was back when the seller bought it. Um, and then now it's in the seller's hands to go and do whatever they want with it. So the money goes back in the economy. It's not like I'm sitting on a whole bunch of cash. So yeah. when you say that you save 99% of your income, that excludes the reinvestment in real estate. That includes it because that I see as an investment. So even though I'm spending the money, I'm spending it back on real estate. So I'll save all my money as mm. much as I can, like 99%. Um, and then when, when I get that 99%, I'll save it up and try to buy another property with it. So I wait for a good deal to come up that makes okay. sense to buy, and then I spend it all on a property. And so that is not just the 1% of your income that's buying those properties. That's in that 99% oh, yeah, which no, you no, no. did oh, save. If I could buy okay. a property of like, 1% no, of my income, oh my God, no. no. Um, okay, so that that does change it substantially because I know I don't have the numbers off the top of my head and I really should because there's all those very clear, um, you know, economic studies about like $1 spent at, you know, a local store provides yeah, but, X amount or versus, and when holding it in the market uh, tends to be one of the lowest, like general sort of but even if you're investing, even if you put it in a broad mm. index fund, you're putting your money back in the economy. It's flowing through businesses. If they have more money. They raise the stock price so they can do more things to the economy. They can create more products. They can invest more in innovation or research and development. There's, there's, there's a, if, if someone is literally just saving their money and mm. doing nothing with it, first of all, that's pointless. And financially, that makes no sense whatsoever. But if you invest it, if you do anything else with it, it goes back in the economy. So I would definitely not call it hoarding. It does, but when you put it in the market, and again, I really should have these numbers on hand, it tends to generate uh, a much lower amount of value for the average person um, in the sense of like if you are putting – so if you give, uh, let's say, if you put a dollar into – you know, a local business, which is going to likely go to, you know, those two people's personal incomes yeah. who own the business, which they will then almost certainly immediately put back into another but, business. But whereas, why would, but here's from a market supply and demand standpoint, why would I go and put it in a local business when you could find it cheaper, let's say online, you could find a better deal online. I just think that's, that's market supply and demand dictating where people's money is going. If you find a better product at a cheaper price, that makes sense. My question about all of this would be about scale. Like, I couldn't tell everyone in my life to do this and everyone in the world to do this because how would the economy, like, have to refocus and, like, reshift everything? Especially if we were to shift all of our purchases to be online, then a lot of local businesses then would dry up. Well, all local business would dry up and we would be outsourcing a ton of stuff. So do you see yourself as having had a decision that you are going to be part of a niche that's able to do this and... Um, you'll benefit from the fact that you'll be going against the grain? Or would you recommend that everybody do it? And then if that's true, I'm not asking you yeah. sociopolitically yeah. to solve the economy, yeah. but what, what, what would the situation be if every single person was like, I'm doing this? They wouldn't. I mean, we could talk realistically. Not everyone is going to save the majority of their income. Not everyone wants to. And a lot of people have no desire to. And that's totally fine. 
I would say my encouragement comes for the people who do want to save money and invest it and build up a, a, right. a foundation for retirement. That, that's, my, that's my target and that's my demographic. Yeah. So not everyone will do it. There will always be a demand for you know someone going in a mom and pop shop. And I fully support that because there is demand for that. And there is a need for people who want something immediately until drones take over, in which case you'll press a button and a drone will come in like a few seconds. Well, but to that point, to answer your earlier question about why what the incentive would be to buy from a small business where the cost of the product is going to be, in many cases, like significantly higher to the point that for people who are managing a budget, like, you know, if you can get it on, you know, uh, an online retailer for $3 and buy it at a mom and pop for 10, you know, that's a huge disparity that does have a huge impact. And to your point, there is that law of, you know, what are your incentives? What's the supply and demand? But I guess for me, the issue is like, if I'm buying that thing at that rock you know, bottom price, often that will represent a lot of, for example, quality of life issues of the employees, or it will mean perhaps that all of the production is outsourced, or it will mean that uh, the perhaps their, um, you know, environmental practices aren't su super sustainable. So I do feel like when I think about the purchases that I'm making and the price that I'm getting it for, I try to think about, well, what are those dollars actually representing? Why does it cost this much more? And is that higher price differential something that I want to support mm -hmm. personally? I think maybe also my other question riding on that would be altruism. Like, do you do you need to have for yourself personally? And this is not a value judgment because I can't decide like how your incentives need to go. But do you need to have a tax incentive for you to donate a certain amount of money to causes you support? Or do you get a sense of personal personal satisfaction from doing that? Because I know sometimes I will donate more than makes sense for me on my taxes, but it's because I know I can sleep at night thinking like, well, I tried to help. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I don't think it's just money. I don't think you just mm. have to donate money and I don't think that money is the solution to everything. I think money can, can almost act as a band-aid to somewhat alleviate some underlying problems, but I think it's more important to fix the issue at hand. And in terms of donating, I think you could just as easily donate your time or just, I think regardless of how much money you have, it's important just to be a good person to help other people out. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you see trash on the ground, pick it up and just and just overall be a good human. Uh, oh, well, someone came in and was like, okay. th this is a bit misleading to someone who said it was hoarding wealth. They were like, he, he lives a frugal lifestyle, so spends 1% of his income on lifestyle and expenses, but the other 99% is uh, used to grow his business in real estate. Yeah. So another person. There we go. What is his day-to-day -day quality of life like? Is he actually working most of the time and not ever treating himself to buying something nice or going out with his friends? I think the misconception is that if I'm not treating myself, I'm not enjoying myself or mm. that I need to go out and, and treat myself or do something special for myself to, to have fun. And that is not the case. I have so much fun working. I have so much fun getting into like reading the internet and finding out what people are talking about or like what's the new trend. Like to me, it's 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 like playing a game of Monopoly online and just like reading and seeing what people and getting involved in like and that community, that the whole community aspect of like YouTube and seeing like people get so excited when you like. I have so much fun with that. Uh, so that is my way in a weird way of treating myself is just immersing myself in business and I love it. Um, in terms of what my day to day is like, I mean, a lot of it is spent is spent working. I mean, now I'm waking up at like five thirty, six a.m. in the morning, and all. Was that early. natural for you, or was it hard to do? Um, now it's natural. At at first it was not, but then I started doing it, and like a week into it, I'm like, I really like it. For Damn, some a week, yeah. I, I don't know. I, my whole life, but, I've not been able to be a morning person. Yeah, but right. no, I I find myself now. I'm a morning person. As weird as it, it's, there's something about it being early morning, like six a.m., and the sun's like barely coming up, and you just feel like you're ahead of the game. There's something about it that is is better to me now than working at like one o'clock in the morning. Because before I would I would shift my entire schedule. Like I would wake up at like nine a.m. and I'd, I'd like you know take breaks throughout the day and then be up until like one. But I found that beyond a certain point, I started getting drained late mm. at night that waking up early in the morning just kind of solves. Um, but in terms of going out and like treating myself, you know, seeing friends, I end up seeing friends like once or twice a week and oh, just nice. going and hanging out. It's more but, than a lot of people. Yeah. Um, mostly weekends. I try to take as many weekends as I can off and not really do much. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I certainly don't feel like I've ever deprived myself. That's good. How much of your time is spent um, when you're being super frugal? Like, you know, you see some of those like TLC shows about extreme couponers. How much of your time is spent like <laughs> trying to find a deal for you to do something that you otherwise wouldn't splurge on, like a free ticket to Disneyland uh, or a happy hour? Probably too long. That's that's probably not worth my time. 
Part of it is I enjoy it. Yeah, it's um, like a game. It, it is like a game. Like it sounds so weird, but I save those coupons so they leave on like your front door. You ever get those? Oh, I just yeah. used one recently. I just moved, and they give you if when you change your address oh, with the postal service, they give you a huge. Yeah. I just use a bunch of them. Yeah, so I've spent a lot of time like saving those and yeah. like organizing them and keeping them for like you know special occasions. There's no shame in that. <laughs> yeah, I have a yeah. question. Actually, is yeah. your girlfriend very much the same ethos as you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you meet because of that? Um, I would say we did. We certainly hit it off because like I really like happy hour sushi, and so does she. Um, so that I, I think was like the glue that just like all of a sudden like bonded us together. Uh, but not like, but, but she has a similar mindset as me that you don't need to have like spend a lot of money to have a good time. You could do things on a budget and we enjoy saving money together. And that I think is just like, that's so rare to find. I think, uh, do you know what her like splurges are? Oh man. What are her it's like the newlywed yeah. game? <laughs> Jeez. Um, I would say, I mean, candy corn. Candy corn. <laughs> No, what I was sorry. expecting. I was I'm sorry, like manicures. Or something. She's gonna watch this. Sorry, expose. <laughs> the most controversial candy, no less. <laughs> um, and by the way, no matter what your splurge or save moment is, you are going to need to track that budget. And one of the tools that will help keep your expenses in order if you are a business, and do not forget that if you just work for yourself or you freelance or you side gig a little bit, you are a business of one, is QuickBooks. QuickBooks basically helps you manage and visualize and understand every element of your professional finances. I start basically every day at TFD by opening up QuickBooks to check where we are in all of our different accounts, with our expenses, the invoices we've paid versus the one they owe. Just basically, it's a little dashboard that keeps everything exactly where you need it at your fingertips to understand the finances of your business. And trust me when I say that this kind of stuff is incredibly hard to keep track of if you don't have the right tool to help you. Before we use QuickBooks, we tried to do our entire businesses like accounting and taxes and expenses like on actual pieces of paper. <laughs> which was insane looking back. Anyway, suffice to say, QuickBooks is the best when it comes to managing your business finances, and you can get started with them right away by clicking the link in our description or our show notes. Um, okay, so I actually didn't know this about you, but a lot of people were implying in your their questions that you're a big like credit card points and miles hacker. Yes, yes. So I consider myself like I have recently become because I, I fly quite a lot. And one thing that's very important to me is like the quality of my flight experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very now into like my Delta status, my Delta miles, like all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, but I haven't really gone beyond that very far because I feel like it can be quite intimidating. Um, what are some recommendations that you have for people who want to get into miles and point hacking, but like myself may not be like naturally inclined to do it? I would start small. And one of the most basic cards that people can get, and this is the card that got me into the whole like credit card game was the American Express gold card. And I feel like that is like the gateway credit card for a lot of people to get into like <laughs> churning and getting points mm. is the American Express gold card. It's just for it's a two hundred and fifty dollar annual. I'm going to sell the card really quick. It, you know, I'm not oh, getting no. no there's no referral <laughs> links or anything like that. It's just this is purely my excitement on the card. Yes. Um, there's a link out there. You have to find it, and you have to do some searching on Google incognito mode to find this thing. Um, but there's a there's a there's an offer fifty thousand points when you spend two thousand dollars in the first three months on the card. Fifty thousand points. You realize when you transfer to a, a partner called Aeroplan, that's worth two round trip plane tickets anywhere in North America. Mm. Uh, typically, it's Air Canada uh, and United are the two main flights from those. Uh, but just consider it two round trip plane tickets for free. In addition to that, you know there is a two hundred fifty dollars annual fee. Mm. But like I said, you get two round trip plane tickets. Some yes. of those can cost up to five hundred dollars a piece. So that's almost like a thousand dollars in value right there. Plus you're getting a one hundred and twenty dollars dining credit. Plus you're getting a hundred dollars airline credit, and like all these other things, you'll be able to make like a thousand dollars just from opening up this card right off the bat. Yeah. Um, but once I did that and booked my first flight, I'm like, ooh, what's next? And then for me, it was a Chase Sapphire Reserve when they had the 100,000. Everyone's got that yeah. Sapphire, babe. Yeah, when they had 100,000 sign-up point offer. But that, and that was worth like, you know, $1,500 in free travel. Yeah. Uh, right now, it's it's 50,000 points. But still, that's $750 worth of free travel when you spend 4,000 the first three months. Yeah. So it's really easy to get it. I, I wouldn't get overwhelmed because there's so many offers out there. 
I would just spit, stick with the big credit cards first, American Express and Chase are really the, the best ones to start out with. That's what I use. And just, yeah, and just load up on points. I um I definitely, so I use uh, everything, like Amex partners with Delta. So mm-hmm. I have like uh, one for business, one for personal, but I churn as much as I can through for the miles just because that's where it's most useful to me. But one thing I've started doing, which I absolutely love, uh, is getting tickets for other people with miles because it's just like such a great gift because mm-hmm. air travel is something that a lot of people won't treat themselves to. But like, if you can like be like, come out and visit and I'm doing it all on miles. It's like, it's the nicest thing. I And I feel like the one thing that I, I realized with doing that that I didn't realize before is that something, and I should really extrapolate this to other credit card mm. strategies because what seemed so intimidating before, like now it's like, I can quote you a good mile to dollar ratio. You like give me the two numbers. I'm like, bad, wait two weeks. Yeah, yeah, like, right. And so you can really sort of like internalize these things and, and start to, it, it's almost like you speak the language yeah. a little bit, which is exciting. Yeah, it is. Num- uh, another question. With the talks of a recession on the horizon, one, how should we prepare for that hit on our finances slash the real estate market? And two, what are the best tips and worst tips that we should adhere to? I.e., I was told to buy, buy, buy because when the market goes up, I can sell. I don't get any time people talk about the, the, the market is going to go down, these recession talks. There's always recession talks. I, I remember last year, people were talking about a recession. A recession is like going to come the next year. And now the markets are up. Like this year is something like 20%. Now, over the last two years, the, the market has averaged 7%. Fine. But still, I mean, had you listened to these people in 2015 saying that the market was about to crash, you would have missed out on like 35% of, of profit right there. Ignore all the recession talk. I think it's completely useless. Everyone just keeps predicting a recession until eventually they're right. And then all of a sudden they, they're, they're like, oh, I'm a genius. And they get all these book deals and everyone listens to them because they were right once, but they forget the 50 times they predicted the market was going to crash and they were wrong. So I don't think I would ever plan or, or strategize or try to time the market in such a way to like predict a crash, a crash because chances are you'll be wrong most of the time. Um, and overall, the market does go up more than it goes down. But I would say the best things you can do is just make sure uh, you have an emergency fund of three to six months. That way, if the market does go down, you're not going to need to sell off your investments to pay your bills. So an emergency fund um, to really optimize your your spending as much as you can and just cut out things that you don't really need that aren't mm. really adding much value. That way you get your expenses down. Um, and besides that, I would really just make sure you work hard and, and you make yourself as indispensable in your career as possible. And that way, if there is downsizing of any sort, um, at the very least, they'll know that you contribute a little bit more than everyone else and would be less likely to be let go. Yeah, I feel like I, uh, so I do agree with that to an extent in the sense that uh, no one can predict the market. If they could, there would be a lot more really rich people out there, um, but I think more importantly than that, even if you could predict the market, you can't predict your own life and what is going to be happening at that time in your life. So I feel like more, because I, I mean, obviously we, we do know that these things are cyclical and that it's likely that there will be some kind of a recession eventually, yes. um, whether that's in the next six, 18 or, you know, 50 months, we don't know, but right. we know that it's likely to happen. Agreed. So I think my general philosophy, and I think there are times that I lean into it more than others when it seems more likely to be sooner than later is to keep your options open as much as possible, which I think you very much agree with. Um, but also try to build in as much flexibility as you can to your own big life financial moments. As an example, um, to not feel like you are so tied into when you need to own a home that you're going to be incredibly tied to how much those homes might be costing. Or if you, for example, were investing in the market to grow your down payment fund, uh, really beholden to when you're taking it out. Um, or similarly, if you have a, if you're going to retire in the next five years, uh, doing everything you can to protect yourself against having to retire into a terrible market. Agreed. Um, you know, whether that's potentially setting up a second job that you could hold on to just a year if you absolutely needed to, to delay retirement, or whether it's, you know, really diversifying uh, your streams of income for like the five years before that. So you have a much bigger emergency fund cushion to live on before you have to take that money out. Whatever it is, just making sure that you are not completely subject to the whims of the market. I agree. Look at that. We agree. We agree. I want to know how he prioritizes his mental health, including preventing burnout. How does he set boundaries in his life? That's something, admittedly, I'm working on. And I'm not, I'm far from perfect on that. I get to a point where sometimes, oftentimes, I will work myself 
to burnout at a point where all of a sudden I am just I, I'm just over it. That's and I feel bad, like Graham. It, it is. That's something I'm working on, and <laughs> and I fully acknowledge that 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 is not a strength of mine. So I've tried. Um, this is actually something I've been doing over the last like month or so. So this is relatively new. I tried meditating, believe it or not, twice a day, um, meditating for 15 minutes and giving myself like no distractions, no noise, no nothing. Uh, phone is on. Do not disturb. Like everything. Meditating 15 minutes twice a day, which I think has helped. Um, but beyond that, I've taken more time to myself. Like one of, one of the things is I, I really enjoy washing my car. So like twice a week, I'll just go and wash my car for 30 minutes. And that to me yeah. is like, is relaxing. Uh, going to the gym, uh, is usually like three to four times a week. I'll go to the gym for about an hour and mm. that's just a way for me to tune out. Um, so I'm definitely improving those things. And like some of the other things I want to get back into playing the drums, which is something that I've, I've not done in quite a long time and set up another saltwater aquarium. Is, is one of those oh, things is like, that's my, pure. yeah, but that, but that's my, like, that's my way of, of relaxing. I, listen, I have not found a solution to that. I've not found a balance to that quite yet. That is good for me. Um, I'm working on it though. I'm very much of the opinion that everyone should go to therapy a couple times in their life. Uh, I think most people have, I think a misconception that you need to have like some horrible thing wrong oh, yeah. with you to go to therapy. But I find that it's often just really interesting to have, uh, that outside perspective on your life mm -hmm. and habits. And often you can find that, you know, especially if you're someone who has a really, really hard time setting up those boundaries in your life or finding that balance could be good to get a, an outside view. Yeah. Also, I am a huge proponent, like I was mentioning when I only work 40 hours a week, part of that is because I have a lot of hobbies and I feel like it's really healthy to have not really so much the hobby in terms of like just the fun and entertainment, but I feel like for people who, you know, obviously we both own our own businesses, um, or for anyone who has a job that's very demanding and involving and, and, and passionate in that, it can become one of your only litmus tests of identity, of worth, of value, one of your only easy like measurement sticks in your life. And I feel like when you have other hobbies that you're really passionate about, like the drums, you could be like, I'm this much better at the drums than I was of last course, week. Yeah. And it becomes, I don't know, it's good to like diversify your own identity. I completely agree with you on all aspects of that. Um, so far, my mentality has really just been this is the internet and this yes. is how I've grown my career and it's so fickle and I, I don't know how long it's going to last. So I may as well just like run with it as long as I can and like double down while it's good because I'm afraid that like in the future, what if, what if it ends or what, you know, like it, it's, it's not very, wrong. yeah. So it, I feel like it's such a short term thing that I may as well, while it's good, just double down. And so that's been my mindset so far. I, I agree. It's probably not the healthiest to double down like that. Um, but I also see it as something that's, that's not going to last forever and it's going to be short term. Well, honestly, that's a hopefully I'm wrong. I, like I, I would hopefully. like I would like for this to last forever, but I also realize that sometimes I I am just at the whims of an algorithm that you know there, it's just a flip of a switch, everything could change. So I kind of acknowledge that that I don't want to be caught in in you know thinking it's going to last forever. That's a much healthier approach than I think a lot of uh, creators have mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube because I think you know, we were talking about I was talking I interviewed recently Ingrid Nelson who's a, a beauty YouTuber she's been around for a long time um, and she you know was expressing kind of the same stuff but it's pretty uncommon this idea that like just because you are popular at a given moment whether it's with the algorithm or with the audience that does that in no way means that there's something that's going to be intrinsically popular about you. It's a moment, it's a combination of factors, it's where the algorithm's placing you. And I think having a really healthy relationship to like, this could be over tomorrow and I have to be okay with that, mm. both financially and emotionally is extremely important. I agree. And my goal, I mean, if, if I could have picked anything is like, I really look up to people like Dr. Phil, as weird as it sounds like, I, I love Dr. <laughs> Phil, uh, Dave Ramsey and Joe Rogan are the people that I look at and like, I love the whole like talk show uh, formats. I think a lot of those people have had like significant longevity in their careers. So I look up to those people and like one day I'd be like, I want to be the Dr. Phil of, of finance. Like I would love that and combine the aspects of like the spontaneity of Joe Rogan um, and just, and just the, the groundedness of Dave Ramsey. So if I could yeah. just combine all of them and build my career from that, like that's, that's where I would love one day. This is going to sound very shocking to some yeah. of you, but I actually watch a lot of Joe Rogan. Um, so good. I do. And it's funny yeah. too, because I think like, to me, I feel like I have this, I, it's almost like a parallel universe a little bit to me because he, I think similar to you, like the vast majority of his guests and his audience are men. Um, and he speaks to a lot of different topics than I speak to. And he uh, has a lot of different takes on a lot of issues than I do, but he's so profoundly popular mm -hmm. and his 
his words mean so much to the people who follow him. And I think um, one thing that I really like about a lot of his interviews, and I've, I have several that I've watched multiple times because I think they're very interesting, is that he's one of the few people that you can see interview someone like, um, he'll, in, he'll interview a libertarian and then he'll interview Bernie Sanders and give yeah. both of them uh, a really fair shake and be curious about both of them. And uh, and I think there are not as many shows as we would like to think that are willing to do that. I agree. And it's so it's really nice to to have that. And I think often um, people tend to get in these feedback loops of like wanting to only listen to things that they already agree with or strategies they already follow. And, you know, although obviously we have a lot of different stances on things, I think it's ultimately beneficial to to be able to talk about them. I agree. And I really admire for Joe Rogan the fact that he's so level-headed and logical. And and I, I don't think he really lets emotion dictate, you know, how he interviews people, but he's just so grounded in that, that I really, I really like that. He has a, a very good interview with a guy named Johan Hari, who wrote a book that I really enjoy. That's all about the exploration of like happiness and what mm. causes what what happiness really is, and you know how we get there, and why a lot of us are not happy. And yeah. highly recommend it. Check it out. It's very interesting. We got a lot of nice ones being like, "This is the most ambitious crossover." <laughs> in <the history> of- <laughs> top ten, top ten anime crossovers, two thousand nineteen. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Graham often critiques people for having moderate amounts of discretionary spending while already meeting generally recommended savings amounts, i.e. 15 to 20%. And does he think at any point discretionary spending actually does improve quality of life? No, no, no. I I think people sometimes take me out of context if they've Mm. never seen my videos before, especially the like millennial money or my reaction videos where I critique people. A lot of that is satire. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, knock someone if they're spending $150 a month on, on their groceries. I will say like, what, $150? You can go and do that for $100. You know, it's funny. I think it's, I think it's funny. I mean, I just have a weird sense of humor. But I think in the bigger picture, it gets people interested in personal finance mm. if you could add in a little bit of humor to it. Whereas someone before would be like, oh, I don't, I don't care about personal finance. But when you make it fun and exciting and you just inject a little light, you know, lightheartedness in it, I think it goes a long way. So I don't want people thinking that all my reaction videos like that are completely serious. Like I don't care if someone spends, you know, $100 a month on hair extensions. Uh, you, you know, I, I can make fun of it a little bit because I think it's funny. But I don't care. And it in, in no way will, will you know, impact their, their future. But I think if, again, if you could you know, educate people and make it funny and kind of bring in some, you know, satire in it, that that's what it's about. You would tear my mint to shreds. Oh. You would be like, we could do, what are you we spending could, on? We could do a reaction video if you want to do oh. <laughs> Reviewing your finances will break it down. <laughs> I mean, we, the thing is that I feel like it would attract a lot of people who, like being really mean to me. No. You uh, know what? The, the good thing is everyone so far who's commented on this video, like everyone is so nice and mm. is so supportive. And Sure, some people are like, you shouldn't be spending that much money on Diet Coke. Mm. But uh, but overall, the vast majority of it is, is either positive or it's just like, lighthearted humor. Mm. What do you think of the fire movement? I love the fire movement. I'm a hu- huge fan of the fire movement. I Hell's think <laughs> I think it's cool that it's finally becoming a thing and finally becoming more mainstream and like trendy to be financially literate. I don't know if it's just because I'm immersed in this that I'm starting to see more people into saving money and investing than I did previously. Overall, though, at least, uh, you know, anecdotally on YouTube, it seems like there are way more investing channels out there. There are way more people talking about personal finance, uh, even bigger people, like huge channels that are talking about like, oh, yeah, so I save all my money and, you know, I invest. And it's cool to see it becoming more mainstream and more people are thinking carefully about where they spend their money and investing it, I think is fantastic. Have your saving priorities slash motivations changed over the years? That's a really good question. Um, I would say they not a lot's changed. I mean, for me, I've really just been doing the same thing repetitively. Mm. I haven't really changed much. I don't spend much more than I did, you know, several years ago. Um, my motivation hasn't really changed that much. I, I don't think there's been much of it. I, I like to think I'm pretty much the same person as it was, you know, five, six years ago. Same. Actually, no, I was, I was a much worse person six years ago. Um, ooh, last question before we get to our rapid fire, which we do with every single guest. Okay. If sometimes you're not spending any of that 99% is because you get anxiety at spending that money. Ooh, 
Wow, these are great questions. Sometimes. Um, and, and it's weird, and I fully acknowledge that this makes no sense, but uh, I get more anxiety spending smaller amounts of money than I do bigger amounts of money. Um, I'll take the, 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 the watch, for example. Now, this, it was a really sentimental watch, and I got this because my grandpa had a Zenith El Primero, and this is the 50th anniversary watch that, that he had, uh, that when he passed away, I started wearing the watch. Um, but yeah, the watch was like 19 grand. I, I didn't bat an eye at that. But I go crazy. And you rip people apart for yeah. Sarah but it's First, two things. One, it's sentimental. And second, these watches keep their value. So it's basically, <clears throat> this is the equivalent of me keeping, you know, 20 grand, let's say, in, in a savings account. Mm -hmm. There's no difference whatsoever between, you know, a fine watch and a savings account. You're not going to lose any value on it. It's not like you're going and burning 19 grand. Um, so from that perspective, it, it's a good investment. Uh, typically, watches like that do sometimes go up in value. It's usually with inflation, but still, it's a savings account. Um, I get more anxiety about, about like, you know, I missed happy hour by 10 minutes and now the sushi is going to be like $3 more. And I think the reason why is because I perceive what under $100 could buy. Like I know like growing up $20 would be, I can get a Subway sandwich, put $10 in the gas tank and then, you know, spend $5 on something else. Like I know what the value is of like 10, 20, $30. Um, I don't perceive so much as the value of like 50 grand or a hundred grand. Cause to me, it, it's such an amount that I can't really comprehend what that would do or what that would buy, but I know like $50, like just how much you could do with 50 bucks. That so is I get, fascinating. so yeah, so I get more anxiety if there's something that's like, like a $3 Snickers bar at the grocery store than I would about spending, let's say like $8,000 on like a really good insurance policy or something like that. Um, makes no sense, but at least I can kind of rationalize it that, that I, I, I have an easier time comprehending $2 than I do 20,000. Mm. For better or worse, but a that does mean that like thousand dollar watch. Yeah, I'm gonna do a reaction video about that. <laughs> Shit. He spent yeah. what? <laughs> it's an investment, though. It's an investment. Listen, but yeah. this is where we differ. I, yeah. You could spend on anything, and I have no judgment on you. So now we get to go to the most special and beloved questions of all our rapid fire questions, which this week we are bringing to you in partnership with Mint, my favorite budgeting tool, which I'll tell you guys about later. So Graham, let's get right into them. And here's the thing. They are technically rapid fire, but you're allowed to go long on an answer if you need to. Don't feel like everything has to be like one word. Live your truth. Let me try. Okay. Number one, and let's go with the real estate industry for this one. What is the big financial secret of your industry? Yeah, I would say, I wouldn't even call it like a financial uh, mystery or anything like that, but open houses, I would say, are mainly for the agent and less about selling the house. Uh, I very really? rarely sold an, uh, a house from holding an open house. Rarely. Most of the time, it's for an agent to meet prospective buyers or sellers that walk in the open house because any person that walks in there is a potential client. Uh, now, it's good exposure for the house, obviously, but I think the main reason people do it is really to pick up clients from it. This is funny. One of my, fa I'm like the worst for brokers because one of my favorite hobbies is going to open houses in New York because I yeah. just love to see them. Yeah. Um, and of course, I'm never going to buy them. I don't want to, but I'm just like... Uh, yeah, here, let me poke around and I'm sure they can sense it on me. They're like, get out of here, you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> what do you invest in versus what are you cheap about? Well, I think we all know that, but. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously real estate is yes. my number one investment. What am I cheap on? I mean, obviously coffee, uh, clothes I tend to be a little bit cheap on. I try to like always find like this jacket was a Black Friday deal that was over like 50% off. Um, super nice. happy and it fit me, which is cool. But nice. uh, I would say clothes you. and coffee and, and just eating out in general. Uh, how many, how many properties do you own? Do you even know? Six. Oh, six. Okay. Six, yeah. I thought you were like 75. Oh, no, no. Six. Do you actively manage them all yourself or do you work All with... but one. Oh, wow. One of them I have a property manager on. Uh, there was a vacancy and I didn't want to deal with re-renting it out. So the only way to get it rented was to hire a property manager. So far, so good on that. Knock on wood. It's been about a year and a half now with the property manager. Great. Uh, the other ones I all manage myself. It's pretty easy. How much of your time is, is taken up just property managing? Hour a month. If oh, wow. That, yeah. Nice. Yeah. You, you own your principal residence. Yes. Nice. Yeah. The trick, by the way, with managing properties, you get really good tenants from the very beginning and you preferably don't raise their rent because I have a lot of the same tenants that I've had for like seven years. And some of the tenants, I just have not raised their rent whatsoever and they choose to stay and take really good care of it. So for me, that means less I have to manage it, less turnover I have, less I have to go and fix it up when they you know move out. So I'd rather keep a tenant in there much longer, even if I make less money, because it's easier for me to manage. Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> So good. Um, what has been your best investment and why? 
Best investment, I would say, has been, uh, in terms of percentage return, probably the first property I bought. I bought it for $59,500. I spent $12,000 renovating it. So I'm, I'm in at seventy two. dollars Now the house is worth anywhere between two hundred and fifty dollars and $300,000. And for the last seven years, I've made like $1,200 a month from it. So that's been my best investment by far. Damn, yours is like really precise in his numbers. A lot of people are like, my dreams. <laughs> oh, no, no. When it comes to numbers like this, like I, I am so like on it with, with numbers. That's good. Yeah. That's good. What has been your biggest money mistake and why? I would say my biggest money mistake so far was not getting a credit card when I turned 18. And I grew up with the mentality of like credit cards are evil. And both my parents were like, you should pay with a debit card. It, it, only the, the people who use credit cards just can't afford it. And that's why they're using a credit card. So I really believe that mentality. Uh, but when I started investing in real estate, I was 21, never had a credit card before. And I wanted to go to a bank to get a loan to buy real estate back then. And every bank denied me on a loan because I had no credit history. Even though I had two good years of tax returns, I was, you know, working as an agent and I had, I, I could put like, you know, 50% down on a property. No one wanted to give me a loan just because I didn't have that credit score. So that was a huge wake up call for me to be like, okay, credit cards are not bad. I, you just, you just need to learn the system and play it. Um, and that's when I got my first car, uh, credit card. It was like a secured credit card for the thing, like 300 bucks or something like that. Uh, and then I started really paying attention to my credit score and like building my credit and doing everything I could to, you know, now have close to an 800 score. Interestingly, probably my single biggest money mistake was getting a credit card at 18, uh -oh. which I used to destroy my life. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Double, double sided yeah. sword. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because both ways, yeah. That's, but that's something that's like really worth remembering. Like if you are a person who knows that you will really mess yourself up with a credit card, then you should find everything you can do to like pr protect yourself Like Dave from Ramsey. That. Find yourself a good Dave Ramsey. Mm. What is your biggest current money insecurity? I would say my biggest insecurity when it comes to money is, is realizing that I, you don't need to squeeze out every inch of profit and try to always pick like the best performing investment at all time. I, and, and, and that for me is a big thing because I always try to like hold out for the best deal or to wait for that like one unicorn deal every time. And that gives me a lot of stress. Mm. And I, I, I've started to realize that, like, listen, not every single thing needs to be a home run. You can hit, like, a third base investment. And it's still going to be really good. And in the long run, it's not going to make a huge difference. But I think it's more important to um, have just sound investment philosophies from the very beginning than try to do, like, the most profitable things at all times. What has been the financial habit that has helped you the most? I would say it's really been tracking my spending. And this is a perfect Ooh. segue into Mint.com. Uh, ah! which we did not talk about that. By the way, that. no, but 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 for real though, when I when I heard Mint, like I use Mint, and I think one of the biggest things for me, uh, not paid to say, that, but for real, has been tracking my spending, and I've been like tracking my spending religiously on Mint since 2012 is when I first started. So Damn. I can go on my Mint account and look back at 2012 and see like exactly what I made that month, uh, exactly what I spent, and that for me it gets you really thinking and really like like aware of where your money is going and how much you're making, how much you're spending. I don't think most people ever do that, and I think people get a lot of just tracking their spending, if even. And just even even if you don't change anything, I think just you being aware of what you're spending is going to help. I fully agree with that. I'm 2013 myself uh, for starting it, and it's funny because I found that the the for I was very avoidant with money before that mm. and had intentionally no idea what I was doing. And I found that the second that I started looking at it, I felt like waves of disgust and immediately wanted to do something about it. Yeah. Um, but generally, if you're avoiding, it's because you know there's something to avoid. So usually, get looking. When did you first feel successful, quote unquote, and what does that word mean to you? Yikes. Um, the <laughs> issue that I see with that is that at every level of so-called success, you see other people who are more successful than you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember thinking, even, even getting to the first million, I remember that day specifically because I remember looking on Mint uh, and seeing it hit a million Shout for real. Out. It is. And, and I remember <laughs> seeing a million and being like, wow, I can, I can finally call myself a millionaire now. And I went out with friends for happy hour sushi. Didn't tell them. I was just like, hey, guys, let's let's meet up tonight and let's get happy hour sushi. And I did. Um, but then you start to realize, like, wait a second. Like, unfortunately, a million dollars doesn't go, as, especially in Los Angeles, it, it doesn't go as far as you would expect. And it's a cool term to say. But then you realize, well, you know, then it's like two and a half. If, if you get two and a half million invested, uh, then at the 4% withdrawal rate, that's 100 grand a year. And then you do that. Um, and, and it's just the threshold keeps going up. 
unfortunately. Um, so I've ne- at least for me, I've never felt so far like like long term that I've been like made it or anything. I think any feelings like that have been short lived because you feel like okay, I reached this goal, great. And now what's the next thing? And I think just we as people want to continue progressing forward and just doing more things and continue uh, becoming the best person you can be, not only in terms of like money goals, but just in being a better person and giving more back or adding more value to, you know, other people's lives. So I think there's always something else. Um, and I, I should probably feel a little bit more accomplished than I do, but I always feel like there's, there's just something, there's something more to get out there and there's something more to do. And, you know, that's, I find that incredibly true. And that's part of the reason why I always, I, I generally keep my salary quite low compared mm-hmm. to what my company takes in, because I find that, Um, like I already feel with what my husband and I combined earn and what we have saved in the value of my company. I feel like this, I, I, there's nothing in my life that I want for, like, there's nothing that I need. There's nothing that I can't do that would, you know, make me happy. Sure. There are times that I like have to make sacrifices or choose between things. And it can be a moment of like a pinch, but I feel like it's ultimately on the whole much better to, to choose to do that if possible, because the alternative is just every day your life gets a bit more comfortable, a bit more easy, a bit more, ex- and it, and it's never enough. Yeah. And you suddenly will look back at what you did six months ago and be like, oh, how could I've ever lived like that? And I feel like to that point, it's so important to have goals and values and gratitude that is completely decoupled from money because otherwise you're just on a perpetual hamster wheel of having more so you want more, Yeah, you know? Um, so I'm definitely very much on board. Well, Graham, this has been the most fascinating and exciting. I'm so glad you came out. Um, you you know, uh, my followers threw, you know, a couple curveballs your way, (laughs) but you handled them with such grace. Um, so where can people find more of you if they want to? Um, YouTube, Graham Stefan on YouTube or GP Stefan on Instagram, but YouTube is probably where it's at. Spell Stefan for us just in case. S-T-E-P-H-A-N. And Graham is like a Graham cracker. G-R-A-H-A-M. Like a Teddy Graham. (laughs) Uh, Well, thank you so much. And thank you guys at home. And we will see you next week. Thanks. Well, listen, as Graham went on a unprompted five-minute rant about Mint Rules. Mint is a budgeting app that I use myself and have used for years and years. It's actually the first financial tool I ever got. It helps you track your budget, visualize your spending, understand your bills, make sure you know when they're due, help automate your payments. It just basically does everything you need it to for a personal finance tool to manage your personal money. It's particularly helpful if you're someone who has a hard time sticking to a budget or understanding your spending, because it doesn't just break down your spending, it puts it into these like beautiful little charts so you can see like, oh no, food is way too much of my money and things like that. Obviously, Graham loves Mint too, and I could not recommend it more if you are someone who has been looking to finally get started on creating your own budget. Check out Mint at the link in our description or our show notes. 